Well, good morning. So great to be with you guys this morning. And what we just experienced, what we just participated in together, uh, that is so much better than any fireworks show or any other thing you're going to do this weekend. Uh, to be able to come together as changed lives and, and praise God who's the one that changed that. That is a celebration. So I was so grateful to be able to be with you this morning. Um, grateful to, to be together to, to learn more about what God wants to do through us in the city of Elkhart here today. Uh, but as you know, it is Independence Day, and as Scott talked about uh, earlier on in our, in our welcome, that's a big deal because, you know, on Independence Day, we celebrate the freedoms that we get to enjoy day in and day out as an American citizen that so many others in the world do not get to celebrate and have. It's a way for us to, to show gratitude for all those who are willing to serve and, and give up their lives so we can enjoy the freedoms that we have. And this morning, we're going to be working through a similar call that Paul is giving to the Christians in Corinth uh, to put our freedoms aside, to put their freedoms aside for the betterment of those around them. And we're going to see for us around us. For those who are just now hopping in and maybe you're just visiting, you're in town uh, for the holiday, uh, we're grateful that you're here with us. But we've been in this series called Called Out. And this series is all about a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, a church that he had planted previously. And they're struggling with some things. See, Corinth was a very dark city. Uh, it was full of paganism and it was a polytheistic culture uh, where there was idol worshiping everywhere. There was tons of money. It was, it was thought of almost like as the sin city of their day. Temptation was everywhere. And so it was a very dark place. And, and Paul, seeing this, he's like, that is the exact place that a church needs to be. He sees the darkness, and he looks at it as an opportunity. And his heart's breaking for those there. And so he decides to plant a church. And he plants this church, and he gets it going. And, and then he goes, and he's continuing planting other churches, and he's on these travels. And so he gets word, though, that there's some struggles going on there, some really big issues. So he spends a good portion, the first you know, six chapters of Corinthians, kind of just reaming them on their behavior, telling them what they're doing wrong, and just asking, why would you even do things like this? But then it moves on to the last half. And last week, Scott talked about, uh, in chapter 7, how how Paul was challenging them that no matter what your relationship is, God wants to use it. He wants to use you where you are to spread the gospel. Well, this morning is a new week, and with a new week is a new issue. Uh, and this week's issue kind of falls in the theme of 4th of July. It's about meat. Meat. Uh, the issue of meat. See, the thing about meat was the, the question that the Corinthians were asking, Paul started ask, answering the questions that they asked to him. They, they had some questions of like, okay, so we understand that Jesus is Lord and there's only one God, um, but with that knowledge, how do we play that out in a culture like ours? And so they asked this question. They asked if they can eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols. It's kind of a question that they want to have answered. Um, the Corinthians uh, want to know how far their freedoms that they have go. See, as Christians, we debate these types of things all the time. Uh, maybe not specifically sacrifice meat, like you're not going through your grocery store wondering if that was sacrificed, if you're picking up some ballpark hot dogs. But we debate on things like whether a Christian should watch movies or shows with violent nudity or, or crude jokes. We debate whether a Christian can play video games based in violence whether it's okay for a Christian to, to gamble or play the lottery. We challenge each other um, if it's okay to use birth control. We, is it okay for Christians to have tattoos or piercings? In the Christian community, we debate about all these issues that are similar to what the Corinthians are kind of going through. See, in Corinth, ancient temples function very differently um, than what you might think. And so this is the, the scenario, this is the culture in which uh, these early Christians are kind of talking about. They're talking about the temples that were used on an everyday basis for multiple different gatherings. It wasn't just for religious services. Um, it was kind of like if you were having a birthday party or something, you're going to the temple. If you have a work gathering, it might even be at the temple. 
And so this was a significant portion of the culture for them. And so they're asking, like, are we supposed to go there? Are we supposed to eat the meat? Like, what does this look like for us? The Corinthians were looking for a black and white answer, but Paul decides to dive a little deeper and give them a filter so that they can begin to answer these questions. He's like, I don't want to just give you a black and white answer. I want to give you a filter, a lens to look through your world to be able to answer the question for yourself on a regular basis. And so in verse 1 of chapter 8, Paul says this. He says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So Paul decides to start off by laying down the groundwork the foundation of what he's going to talk about over the next three chapters. He says, knowledge isn't how a Christian is recognized. It's not by your knowledge or what you know that makes you a Christian. It's really by the love from the knowledge you have. The Corinthians were full of knowledge, and Paul is saying that the knowledge is just puffing up your pride. It's just making you grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And while you're doing that, you're losing sight of what is at the core. Their knowledge was making them make decisions based solely on logic, but not love. Knowledge by itself can be a weapon to destroy, while love builds up. I mean, have you ever been in a discussion with somebody, and they're they're right, they have the right answer, but they're just a complete jerk about it? Like, Paul doesn't want that for the Corinthians. Our knowledge must be balanced by our love. We see Paul share their know-it-all attitude is actually a sign of ignorance when he says, you know, uh, if anyone imagines that they know something, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know what he ought to know. So their knowledge is actually an ignorance in Paul's eyes. He goes on to say in verse 4, he says, Therefore, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. See, in Corinth, there was lots of temples, lots of gods, lots of idols, And so, again, we have to think through the lens of these Corinthians. Like, many of them had been called out from that life. They had been worshiping these idols their entire life. And so this was the culture they were raised in. They're they're believing that these idols were a thing. That's how they had functioned and experienced for so long. These temples, temples, though, they, were, they weren't just like what we talked about with the gathering. They were also like a butcher shop of sorts because these are where the sacrifices would occur. And so the temples would, would sacrifice meat and offer it to an idol. But an idol wouldn't have a very big appetite, I guess, because they only, they only gave a little portion of the meat to the idol. And then the rest of the meat would be sold to uh, in the market or would be used in the temple for feasts. And so these are kind of where the temples are at. And so the, the, the Corinthians are saying, that meat, is it okay for us to eat or not? They're wondering, how do we handle this? How do we walk this out? So Paul responds, but he didn't want to just answer to create a rule for them. He wanted to give them so much more. He wanted to create, uh, communicate the, uh, the heart of the issue. And in, in verse 7 he says, However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. He's saying that some of you, some of the Christians among you, they don't have a strong conscience of that. They don't understand fully that, that Jesus is the only Lord and all these other idols are fake. They're false. It's just talk. It's just sticks and stones that make up a temple. Saying there's some of you that, that are struggling because that's where they were pulled out of. And in their minds, they're, they're trying to, to get there, but it's still, that was an experience that they had had. And he's trying to help them work through that. 
Some were asking questions about this, and some were totally confident in Jesus as the only God. They knew that idols were nothing, that the sacrifice was nothing. Their knowledge was, was grounded in the faith of Jesus, and it was very strong. The knowledge made their conscience free. But Paul writes that not all of them possessed that knowledge. Some were legitimately, like, they were shaken by this. Think about it. These were new believers, and it takes some time for them to really catch up and get up to speed with everything else. I know we live in a culture where uh, people at least have heard, you know, about the church. And and even when they they start coming to church and maybe they're a new believer, there's a little bit more of a foundation there than typically someone in Corinth might have. Paul is saying when you're doing this, you're not loving one another. When you're encouraging one of these new Christians to, to do this, because there's two groups, like there's the Jews and there's the Gentiles, and um, there's all sorts of different individuals in between that are saying, like, it's okay to do this, it's not okay to do this. We, we know that Jesus is the only Lord, so we can do whatever we want. It's just meat. It doesn't matter. God created the meat, so we're good. But then there's the others that kind of come from this background of, no, 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 no. We've got to be different. We can't do that. So Paul's speaking to these others, and and Paul's saying that when you are doing this in front of a weaker conscience Christian, you're actually causing them to sin. The basic command we are given as a Christian is to love one another. Jesus says this in, in John 13, 34. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I loved you. You are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Our love for one another is how others know we are followers of Jesus. It's not based out of our knowledge, it's based out of our love for each other. In 1 John 4, it says it this way, it says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. So Paul sees this circumstance, this issue going on in Corinth, and he looks at it as an opportunity to help them learn how to love each other better. How to to put love before knowledge. And because of this truth of how we're supposed to love each other and how we are recognized as believers by our love, we can do the same thing that they can do. We're to prioritize our love over our knowledge. We can do that in two different ways. The first is that we can lay down our rights for someone else. Lay down our rights. I know it is, it's the 4th of July, and as American citizens, we're, we're all about our rights. They're our rights. Don't take them from us. But a way that we can love someone is by laying down our rights. Another way that we can prioritize our love over our knowledge is to take responsibility for the weak. We're called to take responsibility for the weak. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, he goes on, he says, Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul is saying that it isn't about the food. The food itself is neutral. It's not going to hurt your favor with God or or give you it. Paul is like, I'm going to give you an answer, but it has nothing to do with food. This isn't about rules. This is about the way you handle this right of yours to be able to eat this. Those with greater knowledge were experiencing greater freedom, and their consciences weren't hindering them. They were able to, to worship Jesus and eat food that had been offered to idols. They were able to thank God for the food as the creator. But the others couldn't do that. Their consciences would be defiled if they were to do so. They had the right to live in freedom, and they were experiencing. And and if they were to eat this this meat, as some of the other Christians were encouraging, then, then they would defile their conscience, 
And if they defile their conscience, they're going to live in guilt and shame and not live in the freedom that they had been called to as a Christian. Paul says, hold on. There's something going on so much more important than your rights to the group that are, are caring more about being able to do what they think they should do. As fully devoted followers of Christ, our love for others should limit our liberties. We don't like the sound of that, though, do we? We don't like someone or something keeping us from what's rightfully ours. Like there's whole marketing campaigns that are targeted towards us to just like pull on those strings in our hearts. You know, just do it, right? Campaigns that are saying, it's all about you. Take what you deserve. Our flesh tells us so much differently than to, to lay down our rights. It tells us to take your rights, to demand them at any cost. But that is not what Jesus tells us, and it's not what he did. As I was preparing uh, for the message today, I came across um, a sermon from another pastor, and he had shared this, this excerpt from a missionary named Elizabeth Elliot. Um, and, and Elizabeth Elliot, she was, a, she was a missionary and an author, a Christian author, and she had been serving in Ecuador. And she was serving with her husband, and they were serving these like, native tribes. And while they were serving, while they were going to these tribes trying to share the gospel, her husband had been killed by one of the tribes. He was found with a wooden stake in him, a wooden spear. But she continued to serve as a missionary, and she actually ends up spending two years with that same tribe that had killed her husband. She gave up her right. She had, in her mind, she probably had the right to be angry, the right to hold a grudge, the right to stop, the right to give up. But she didn't. She knew something about giving up rights. This is the list that she, she kind of came up with. As, as a follower of Christ, we give up the right to take revenge. The right to have a comfortable, secure home. The right to spend our money however we please. The right to have an enemy. The right to be honored and served. The right to understand God's plan before we obey. The right to live life by our own rules. The right to hold a grudge. The right to fit into society. The right to do whatever feels good. Or the right to complain. The right to put yourself first. The right to express your sexuality however you want to. The right to rebel against authority. The right to sue another believer. The right to marry whoever you want. The right to end a disappointing marriage for any reason. See, Jesus' primary concern isn't our rights. It's that we love him and follow his example. The way we do this is by taking responsibility for the weak. Paul goes on in verse 10, he says, For if anyone sees you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, he will, not be, uh, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. When more knowledgeable Christians exercise their rights, they may be running over weaker people. They're making a negative impact on those that don't have the same freedom of conscience as you. We lead them into, to feel guilt and shame if they were to, to join us in that behavior. When God wants them to celebrate a life of redemption. It makes a slippery slope for them in their own relationship with Jesus. Take something like alcohol, for example. God does not prohibit alcohol. A Christian can have an alcoholic beverage as long as they don't get drunk or use alcohol as an escape from their problems. But... What if you're with a new believer that has a past with alcohol? Maybe they struggled with it before, and because of this, there's been devastating uh, effects on relationships and their life. They now believe that it's wrong to even have one drink. So you go out to eat with them, and you order a beer with your meal. 
and your brother in Christ is sitting across from you, and he's struggling, and he's, he's dealing with FOMO, which is like just fear of missing out. We've all been there. And he's like, you know what? They're strong Christians, so I'm just going to partake as well. So they order a beer. Their guilt causes them to stumble in their minds. They know in their mind that that was wrong for them, that they shouldn't do that. But they've now sinned by going against their conscience of what they should do. Maybe they pick up uh, drinking too much again from that moment. Maybe they got into the cycle from there. You have just put a stumbling block in their way. You caused them to violate their conscience. This can go for anything. This isn't just food-related. A fully devoted follower of Christ continually limits their own Christian liberties in order to support, care for, and love those that are weaker than them. Throughout the Bible, God is advocated for the care for the weak. Whether it's the orphan, the widow, or the stranger. God cares so much for the weak the Paul says this in verse 12. He says, Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. That's a powerful statement. A statement we need to take to heart. But it's not the only time this is mentioned in the Bible. Jesus himself says it this way in Matthew 18. He says, Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus also plays this out in Matthew 25. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Paul understood this better than anyone. Paul wasn't always Paul. He, he was actually formerly Saul. And Paul, when he was Saul, had an interaction with Jesus, but it wasn't before he was already deciding to, to persecute the church and kill Christians, and try to extinguish what was going on in the early church. But in Acts 9.3, he has this interaction with Jesus, and he says uh, in verse 3, as he was approaching Damascus, in Acts 9, uh, verse 3, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, Saul's actions to Christians were viewed as persecution to Jesus himself. When we sin against each other, when we forget to love each other, when we stand in our freedoms and our rights, when this is more important than loving, we sin against Jesus. So your opportunity to, to answer the question, what will you do to Jesus? It's found in the people around you right now your brothers and sisters in Christ, your family, your coworkers, your friends. Paul says this is how he would respond. He tells the, the, the Corinthians that if I was in your shoes, this is what I would do. First Corinthians 8.13, he says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul says, I give up meat entirely. So we're not going to eat meat today. No, I'm just kidding. No, he says, if that was an issue for my brothers or sisters, I would just give it up. Because it's not worth it. I'd much rather love my brothers and sisters. Paul shares in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 the many examples, the following chapter, of how he's already doing this. He's saying, like, that's what I would do in that circumstance, but I guess what? 
I'm already doing that type of love already. He shares with me, he's like, you know, I could be, um, you know, getting money from you guys to, to, to care for, for me while I'm going around and doing the church, but I'm not. I could have a faithful wife traveling by my side encouraging me, but I'm not because I don't want the distraction from the gospel. Really, the Corinthians should be fully supporting him, yet he doesn't want to hinder the message of the gospel. He's saying, I'm already living this out for you guys. He's not saying to flaunt it. He's not trying to ask for more support. He's just re- making them realize they've already been receiving that type of love from him. What will you do to Jesus? Your answer is an opportunity of how you treat those who suffer when you don't. The people who feel things you don't. Brothers and sisters who have experiences that you don't have. People with consciences that are not as free as yours. See, when I go to a public place like a a store and I have my, my children with me, what I do is, you know, we get them out of the car. It's kind of scary. It's a place for kids in a parking lot. Um, and so I, I get them out of my car, and we hold hands. We walk to the store. And I could go so much faster. If it was just me, I mean, I'd be walking. I'd be getting in there so much quicker. But instead, I walk at their pace and walk with them. If I was to try to pull them at my speed, that, that would hurt them. That they're not ready for that. If I was just to let go and, and run off, they'd be lost. It'd be dangerous. What I do is I walk with them at their pace. All of us have a different pace in different aspects of our Christian walk. When we're with each other, we should be walking at each other's paces to love one another. We should be willing to give up our rights. We need to prioritize our love over knowledge. Don't use your freedom to sin, but to serve. We're called to live in freedom, but not at the expense of others. We have the opportunity to live like Jesus, who gave up his heavenly rights to come down to us. He was king in heaven. He's, he's, he's God of creation. He decides to come down and give up all of his heavenly rights to be with us, to love us, to serve us, to die for us. We're called to live in his example. John 3.16 says this, and we know it so well, but we need to just not let it be something that we just say. We need to live it out and understand that he made the sacrifice for us, and so we can do that for each other. In John 3.16 through 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him gave us the ultimate example of what this looks like. He put his rights aside to love us. He had all the knowledge. He knew he was God. He knows all truth. He is truth. But he chose to love. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the example that you give us here in Scripture of how we can put our knowledge aside, Lord, and love those around us. To let our our knowledge of you and who you are and what you have done fuel our love for others. That we need to take a better look at those around us and not just make assumptions, but to get to know our brothers and sisters around us, Lord, that we can try to not be a stumbling block or a hindrance to them and where you're calling them to be. We apologize for, for, for walking through our lives so senselessly and um, numbingly. We've done so much damage around us that we probably don't even recognize. I pray, Lord, that we can have a better understanding of the people around us, that the Spirit can, can heighten our awareness to the opportunities that you have available to us. We love you but help us love others better. 
pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.